If the children want to go out at this time, uh, grades five and below, fifth grade and below, if you want to go out at this time to be Children's Church with Miss Paula. Why they're doing that, if you would turn in your Bibles to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 4. And everybody gets all excited. Oh, Revelation, we're going to talk about end times. Well, not really. Uh, what I'd like to do for this morning is just give you a glimpse of what heaven is like. Uh, about 2 or 30, so Tuesday morning, <coughs> God did one of those wonderful things that he does and woke me up. And started speaking to me. And David asked me a while ago, he said, how's your week been? I said, best week of my life. Well, you know, what happened? You know, did you have a rich uncle leave you his inheritance or whatever? No, nothing fantastic happened. Nothing out of the order. You know, I had troubles and I mashed my fingers. I got scratches all up and down my arms and from working and doing things. You know, it was a rough week, I guess, but best week of my life. See, God began to work on my heart this week. And he started about 2.30 Tuesday morning. And he began to tell me, Kenny, when do you worship me? Have you thought about worshiping me? You know, and I try. I think, oh, yeah, I worship you, don't I, Lord? I worship you. I'm busy, 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 busy. And even this morning as I, I come in, I said, Lord, I just want to, I just want to focus and I want to get my mind set on you. I want to get my heart prepared for worship. I prayed for you that God would prepare your heart for worship. And you say, oh, the preacher's lost his mind. You're exactly right. I have lost my mind. God's created me a new mind, a new spirit. He's beginning to work in me of what it is, what church is really about. So as we look in Revelation chapter 4, I want you to look and see what is this all about? What is church really about? Is it this building? It's these people. This is hard. And look at what they did here. And I, I know, just bear with me because I want you to get the big picture. After I looked, John is talking and, and he did the messages to the seven churches. And at the beginning of that, he says, After this I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was a, as, as it were of a trumpet talking to me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white remnant. And they had their heads, and had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thundering and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Mark that down. If you come to the tabernacle study, you will see that again. You think, well, the tabernacle way back then? There's a picture of something in the tabernacle right there. Seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass, another picture in heaven that was displayed years ago in the tabernacle. That's just a little sidebar, no extra charge for that. Like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast like the face of man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts which were four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and the re and they rest not day and night. Listen to this. They rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. 
And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him and sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now skip to chapter 5, verse 11. After this, after what we just read in 4, then we have the part where, where he asked who is worthy to open the book, and then the lamb that was in the midst of the multitude came forth as a lamb that had been slain. And he opened and began to break the seals thereof. And then once again, we see worship break out in heaven. And I beheld and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And such as were in the sea and all that are in them heard I, heard I say, heard I saying blessing and honor and glory. And power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Our Father, we can only get a glimpse of heaven. Lord, we can only imagine what it must be like. But as we read your word this morning and we get that picture, just a small glimpse of what heaven must be. Lord, we see the angels and we see the, the redeemed all standing before your throne, worshiping you and falling down before you. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship. Lord, we understand and acknowledge today that every breath we take, every word we say is because of you. Lord, as, we, as I speak these next few minutes, Lord, I ask that by the power of your spirit that you would speak through me. Lord, give me the words to say that they would understand what it is to worship, that I would understand what it is to worship you, Lord. Lord, please don't let us just hear another message this morning. But Lord, as you begin to work on my heart, I pray that you would work on the hearts of your people. And work on the hearts of the churches across this nation and, and in our world, Lord, that we would begin to know the true of worshiping you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, Lord of all, thank you for loving us and allowing me to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Could you get a picture? Tens of thousands. Thousands of thousands of angels. This is where the redeemed, us, were standing before the throne of God. And the 20 and 4 elders, they represent the, the, the tribes and the people. And then they're clothed in white remnant. And, and, and you see emeralds and, and jasper and beautiful things. And, and Isaiah, Isaiah gives a pretty picture of heaven too. Where he said he saw it and the, and the smoke filled the room. And his train went all through the room. You talk a God of glory. A wondrous God. And we just said and we just can. There's a song I can only imagine. I can only imagine what that must be like. And see, I think that's our problem. We just can't imagine. We can't get a picture of it. We can't, we can't really get it in my mind. If we could, we would be like every creature falling down on our face and worshiping a holy God. But see, the church, and I'm not talking about just this church, but all the churches, we've lost sight of that. See, we just have church. This is just... We come in here because this is what we do. We come in here because mama used to drag me in here every Sunday. This is what I was supposed to do on Sunday morning. And we do our thing and 
we walk out the door and we're no different. But I'm telling you, God wants more. Let me, let me show you some things. This is going to be a good message. I'm not going to be mean, I promise you. If you think this is mean, then I'm sorry. I'm not being mean. I want you to get a glimpse of heaven. I want you to understand what this is really all about. Jesus said in John 4, But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Did you see that in verse 23? The Father seeks those to worship him. When's the last time you worshiped him? See, you got me at 2.30 the other morning and asked me the same question, so sorry, you get it too. When's the last time I just really worshiped God for who he is? I just stopped all the running around and the busy and, and doing all this and I got to do this and I got to do that. And, you know, we know the story of Mary and Martha and Martha's fixing and Jesus is here and she's all excited and, and I got to fix the food and, and I got to fix the table and everything's got to be just right for Jesus. And she looks over at Mary and where's he's at? He's at Jesus' feet just sitting there. She's not doing a thing. And Martha said, Jesus, tell Mary to get up and help me. Don't you see I've got a lot to do in this place? And Jesus rebukes Martha and says, hey, Martha, Martha, you're busy about much things. Mary. Mary has chosen the greatest thing, to worship me, to acknowledge who I am. People, the greatest thing we can do for God, and I've always said the only thing you ever do to please God is accept him as your personal savior. Well, I've got another one to add to that, and worship him. That's what he's seeking. That's what he wants. That's what it's all about. We sang a while ago, and I love the song. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Salvation's all about me, right? No. You know, that mansion, those streets of gold aren't going to be worth a hill of beans. It means absolutely nothing when I get in the presence of my God and my Savior, and I can bow down and worship him and thank him for his love. Thank him for saving me. All the mansion, all the gold doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean, this doesn't mean anything if God is not here. If we're not here to worship him. If we're just coming to church. We got to begin to worship him. We got to begin. And boy, I, he woke me up at 2.30 in the morning and did I got to get a hanky. And did that. And, ooh, I've been on cloud nine ever since. Yeah, I've hit my thumb. I've wanted to spit several times. But God showed me some things this week. If you'll worship me, I'll make it better. I'll get your eyes off of you and your problems and fix your eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me. And some of you say, well, I don't like singing. You better get used to it, people. You're going to be doing it for eternity. You're going to be doing it for eternity, so you better start practicing here. That's all I got to say about that. I told you I was going to be nice today. Let's look at worship. Let's look at worship. It's mentioned almost 200 times in the Bible in one way, shape, or form. Worshiped, worshiping, worship. Almost 200 times God mentions worship and the word that, that we are to do it and true worship. Jesus said those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, what is worship? You know, and I understand there are preachers out there. They want to, they want to, uh, all right, everybody's got to come in and you need to raise your hands to God. You know, some worship that way. Some don't. 
You know how I find out God wants me to worship? I just stand there in silence and weep and think of my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. And tears flow down my, that's how I worship. But you might worship with a raised hand. You might worship on one knee before God. I don't know how you, there is no set method. There is no prescribed way in scripture how we must worship in our body posture. But the idea of worship isn't about what we do and did the preacher and did the the praise team leader bring us into an emotional frenzy where we're all in a, that's not worship. If it brings you just into a frenzy and nothing changes, if you don't acknowledge who you're worshiping, so some bow down, some raise their hands, and some weep. Some sing, some pray, and others are just silent. There's no prescribed way. Worship means to give worth to something. Is he worth something? Is he worth something? Is to give worth to a holy God. And I have nothing in his sight. Worship is that I give worth to something. Uh, there's Hebrew words for it, and I'm not going to tell you what you are. One, I can't pronounce them. Two, you won't remember them, so it doesn't matter. But the Hebrew means to bow down or to prostrate one's face before another. The Greek has the same uh, type saying in it, and the, the words that it has is that the, uh, to fall down on your knees. Now, does that mean I got to fall down on my knees to worship? You can. The Bible's not saying you could. It's saying, why do we fall down? Why do we get on our knees? See, in the, in the ancient times, when someone would come up to someone and, and they would fall down before them, that was showing honor and respect to them. I'm sorry, I got to walk around. This is too good for me to just stand up there. In ancient times, they'd fall down before some, showing submission to that person. I am submitted to you. You ever had an old, old dog? That, they tell you that if a dog will roll over on his belly and let you scratch his belly, that's submission. You find a dog that won't do that, you better watch him. He's not very submissive and he might bite you. But if old dog will just come, you've seen them, they just roll over and oh, scratch my belly, scratch my belly. That's showing submission. That's submitting to you. That's, they do it to each other. Uh, but that's, that's a position that the ancient would do is they'd fall down before someone and they would show submission to that person. Bow down and worship is an act of submission to another. I'm acknowledging. See, we have the, the worship of submission is to acknowledge the responsibility to live by the will of one who is superior. So when they would bow down, they would say, I am yours. You are my master. I will do what you say. You are over me. That's what we're doing to God when we worship him. When I fall down before him and I empty myself, I say, you are God, you are holy, you are supreme, and I am nothing in your sight. Your will is my will. I put everything that I have aside. That's what worship is. I forget all this stuff. I focus my attention directly on you so you have a, a worship of submission and from the worship of submission comes a worship of service. See, if I am submitting and I understand that you are supreme and you are holy, I want to serve you. I want to do your will. See, it is as if you love this person, if you are submit, it is your responsibility to submit to the rule of the other. 
I'm just giving you generic definitions, but helping you understand what worship to God is. Submitting to his will, his, what his desires. I told you a few weeks ago in Romans 12, 1, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. That is your spiritual act of worship. When I fall down before him, when I empty myself and look to him, that is submitting my body as a living sacrifice unto him for worship. In the Bible, we have worship of remembrance. Over and over and over, God would tell them, remember when they crossed the Jordan, they had to build a stone thing? Never forget that I brought you out of the land of bondage. Never forget that I brought you over the Jordan and I've given you this promised land. So we have worship of remembrance, of, of remembering God's goodness and God's promise fulfilled. And we also, he had them do worship of God's promise of a coming Messiah. So a worship of remembrance and worship of promises, the, the Passover, they celebrate the Passover every year, right? That is a place of worship where they remember that the blood was applied on the doorstep. And when the death angel come, he overlooked him, and by the blood, they were saved. Good picture there, isn't it? Reckon that tells us something of something that's going to happen years later? Exactly it is. The Passover, but they still worship the Passover. Every festival, the Day of Atonement, all that they did, God said, worship me in remembrance and to looking for the promises that I have. He said, well, that was Old Testament, Brother Kenny. That doesn't apply to us today. Wait a minute. Watch this. What's one of the two ordinances of the church? What are the two ordinances of the church? I remember when I was made deacon and they said, do you know the two ordinances of the church? And I said, oh, I don't know. I was a young man. I was scared to death. Two ordinances of the church. I mean, I've done them all the time. You do them all the time. There are two ordinances of the church. One is baptism. God commands us after we are saved to be baptized of a public profession of faith in him. The second one, he says, What? Communion. Thank you, Miss Shirley. This do in remembrance of me till I come, till my promise is fulfilled. Do you know communion is an act of worship? Of a worship of remembrance of what he's done and what he's going to do? So we see true worship. As I study the tabernacle and all the rest, do you know that that's where worship began? Well, no, let me back up. Worship began when Cain and Abel. And that's a whole other story, I know, and I'm not going to get into that. But they were worshiping. Cain killed Abel because he was jealous. Because God liked his sacrifice better than his. But it was a thing of the heart. But God establishes and ordains worship when he creates the, 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 the tabernacle. He says, I'm going to give you a place where you can come and worship me. Where I will meet with you and, and, and dwell with you. That was the beginning of worship in the tabernacle. God established it. And, and in God established the conditions for worship. They couldn't come into the tabernacle. They couldn't come there without a sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, they could not come in the presence of a holy God. God established the place of worship, the conditions for worship, and then he established the means for worship. See, it was the Levitic, the tribe of Levi. They were the priests, and they had a high priest out of that tribe, and they were the only ones to conduct those ceremonies of worship for God in the tabernacle. You see, this is great, Kenny. I'm going to give you a little glimpse of the study of tabernacle. What does all that mean to me today? Oh, by the way, you know, creation is awesome. 
And Miss Nelson was giving me a little story about where they went and all the beautiful flowers and man, create God's creation. Man, I've been to the Rockies. I've seen those gorgeous mountains. God's creation is beautiful. You know the Bible talks about it in three chapters. Three chapters cover all of God's creation. Do you know the place where God designed and ordained the place of worship where you come before him takes 50 chapters? Do you get in a little picture of how important worship is to God? 50 chapters to tell you how to worship him. Three chapters to tell you about this great universe in which we live. It is important that we worship God. Just a little side note there. Huh? No extra charge for that. So getting back to my thing, how does the tabernacle apply to me, Brother Kenny? What does that mean? God established the place today. Where does the place of worship begin today? In our hearts. He said, I will write my laws and my words on their hearts, and they will be my people. They will worship me. I will write it, my love on their hearts and they'll worship me. He established the condition through Jesus Christ, my Savior. I worship him through Jesus. And he established the means by the power of his Holy Spirit. Come on, people. Are you getting this? How awesome is our God? I'm holy, I'm righteous, and I'm going to welcome you to my presence. And this is how you do it. It's so easy. By the blood of the Lamb, through the power, that's why Jesus said, those who worship me must worship me in spirit by his Holy Spirit. And in truth, by those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This is good. I hope y'all are having a good time because I sure am. I have prayed for this. Lord, show me what to do. Lord, show me, teach me. 2.30 Tuesday morning, he woke me up and he said, this is what I want. This is what I want you. I want you, Kenny, to worship me. Thank you, Lord. He seeks those to worship him. God only is to be worshiped. So he determines the method, the means, and the place of worship. He only is worthy of our praise. So the Old and New Testament all agree, all agree that only God is to be worshiped and God only accepts worship offering by a humbled and committed servant under, the, under God's conditions that is acceptable by the Holy Spirit in the presence of our lives and in our worship. So I'm only supposed to worship on, well, I've got to get a bunch of hankies. I'm only supposed to worship God on Sunday mornings all the time. If he's put it on your heart, worship him. Back in the tabernacle times, they had to go to a certain place and certain things happen at certain times of the year. But since Christ, the veil's been torn. We can go right into the presence of a holy God day or night. Any to 2.30 in the morning or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he's there and I can worship him. I can glorify his name for his saving grace. Well, I hope we're getting this. Why is worship so, okay, so that's great. So we worship God and we know he's holy. We know we ought to worship him. Let me tell you what it did for me this week. Worship is essential for living. I'm over time. I hope that's all right. I've got a few more minutes. It brings our focus on him. It increases our understanding of him and builds our confidence in him. Real quick, I and mean, you can write this down and I'll just read it to you. Some people don't like the Psalms. 
But you better get to liking them because it teaches us how to worship. And David gives a prime example in Psalm 73. He says, all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Does anybody can relate to that? He talks about in the beginning of the chapter about how the rich just keep getting richer and the evil just rich. And God, it just seems like you're blessing them so much. And here I am trying to do what you want me to do. And I have nothing. I'm hiding in caves. Anybody relate to that? It just seems like the world just keeps getting evil and evil and evil and more evil. God, when are you going to do something? And David begins this chapter by pretty much complaining. He said, I've been plagued and I've been chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy people. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Do you see the hurt in David's heart? I'm so frustrated. I'm so down and out. You ever wonder why you're so down and out and you're frustrated and depressed and you can't seem to cope and all the rest? That's where David was. But watch what he does. Verse 17 of chapter 73 said, until I went into the sanctuary of God. That's the way it all was. I was down and out and depressed and all. But wow, let me tell you people. I went into the presence of a holy God in a sanctuary of a holy, and I worshiped him. Look what happened after I went to the presence, uh, I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. His focus turned to where God was and who God was. Verse 22 and 23, and after he realized that, he said, so foolish was I and arrogant. I was as a beast before thee. He's talking to God. I wasn't even worthy to be in your presence. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me in thy right hand. While ago, it was terrible, right? While ago, life was miserable, But when he got in the presence of a holy God and began to worship him, he realized God had him right here in the palm of his hand. And it was going to be okay. God was in control. God knew the end. He understood. He had an understanding of him that became clearer. He began to think as God thinks. When we worship, we begin to think. It becomes clearer what God wants. We begin to think like God wants us to think. Verses 24, Thou shalt guide me in thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. (laughs) Whom have I in heaven but thee? (laughs) If God be for me, who can be against me? (laughs) And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. David is worshiping God. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God, the strength of my heart and the portion forever. Now his confidence turns solely to God. He began to say, oh, it's pitiful. I'm so dattered out. Man, when he got in the presence of a holy God and just began to worship him, look at the transformation just in this chapter. Just in this one chapter. And the Bible's full of this. He acknowledges that. Oh, wait a minute. Let me back up. Verse 27 and 28. And I'm almost through. Y'all bear with me. For they that are far from thee shall perish. For lo, They that are far from thee shall perish. There's no hope. That's what no hope is. To be far from a holy God. To not be able to come into his presence. David says they'll perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is, look at this verse. But it is good for me to draw near to God. David understands and realizes that it's good to have been in the house of the Lord. 
It is good for me that I stand in his presence and that I worship him. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all thy works. He is, declares that it's good to worship God. See, we become like what we worship. What are you worshiping? What's most important to you? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What's mostly coming out of your mouth? My mouth. This is what God told me at 2.30 Tuesday morning. What's coming out of your mouth, Kenny? What are you talking about? What are you complaining about? What is from your heart, what are you speaking? Jesus said about these kind of people, the people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, I think our churches across the nation have got to this point where we're so busy with our programs and our activities and doing this and that, we miss the point of worship. We miss the point of why we come together. And that's to worship him. In spirit and truth, worship comes from a submissive heart that loves him. Worship is an attitude of the heart toward God, not his creation. Romans one twenty five, who changed the truth. He's talking about people with a reprobate mind. He said they've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature, the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. We see that in our world today where people want to just worship nature and they forget there's a creator. And God said, that's a lie. That's not what this is about, people. It's about worshiping him in spirit and truth. What do we do every Sunday? What is an, across the nation, what are churches doing? Are we worshiping a holy God? Or are we worshiping programs and one another? And all this, are we like Martha? Are we just busy, busy, busy? And we forget the focus of why we come together. And that's to worship a holy God. Not to worship this building. See, God's house is a place of worship, not to be worshipped. We come here to worship a holy God. We come to acknowledge that he is supreme. I came in this morning and I opened that door and song come to my mind. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. David wrote that. That's a psalm. Y'all know that? I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is a day that the Lord has made. I will be glad, or I will, what is it? I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Sorry to hear y'all. Y'all had to hear me sing that. But that's what I sang this morning as I walked in. And as I thought about how David would come into the gates of the tabernacle, into the outer court, and into the presence of a holy God. And say it would have been good for me to be in the presence of God. It is good for me to be here. It is good for me. It's good for you to be here. To acknowledge him as supreme and to worship him. It will change your life. It will change your heart. As I read, Robin and David, if you want to come, I'm closing. I'm sorry I took so long, but I couldn't let this just stop. I don't want you to hear a message and walk out and say, Brother Kenny, that was good. I mean, that's nice and all, and I appreciate that. What I want you to do is hear this message and say, God, change my heart. Help me to worship you. There's another song out there that I love to hear. Robin heard it the other day, and wow, 
I'm coming back, Lord, to the heart of worship. He says, I'm sorry for what I've made it to be. I'm sorry that it just became a ritual that I come to church every Sunday. Lord, I want to come back to the heart of worship you. And that's bowing down before you in in submission to you. And recognize you as a holy, loving God that loves me more than I could ever imagine. I'm trying to give you a picture of heaven. But you know what? God is seeking those to do that today that would worship him in spirit and in truth.